Cecchino the Tiny Tom Thumb is the English version of Grimm's 19th century Thumlin and of Perrault's Petit Poussé, published almost 200 years before. The first printed version appeared in London, told by Richard Johnson in 1621. Tom is supposed to have been the favourite dwarf of King Arthur, but we only hear of this a thousand years after Arthur's supposed date of death. Several cognates and parallels of the tale exist in Germany, Denmark, South Europe and India, in which the tiny fellow has many and varied adventures. Like other peasant tales, the one given here ignores morality, Cecchino joins a robber band, his father kills all his brothers, and the happy ending, Cecchino drowns and that is that. This kind of structure, in which anything can happen without need for didactic, is perhaps inherent in the fantasy origins of the story. A chickpea becomes a person, so he really is not anyone at all. The following version was collected from the oral tradition in 19th century Tuscany. Once there lived a poor ignorant carpenter and his wife, who had always prayed for children, but had never been sent any by the Almighty. When the husband came back from his daily work at the shop where he was sewing and hammering making tables and cupboards, he did nothing but make his poor wife's life a misery by saying that it was her fault that they had no children in their long married life. The woman was very sad about this and tried every way she could think of to conceive. She lit many candles in church, made pilgrimages to special places taken to be sure cures for barren women, ate certain herbs and also gave her husband many magic filters. But to no avail. They could not make children and each blamed the other till they made each night a hell upon earth quarrelling till dawn. The carpenter began to spend more and more time at his shop, carving and hammering away at more and more cupboards and chests. The wife lit more candles than she could afford, and said her prayers so often that she was mumbling all the time under her breath, until people began to avoid her, thinking her to be a witch. Life was not happy for either of them, and daily they grew further and further apart and the carpenter was seriously thinking of leaving her and going away to some other place to start all over again. One day, a poor-looking old woman knocked at the door of the humble house and asked for charity. The carpenter's wife said, I cannot give you anything, for I have spent all we can spare on candles and having masses said so that we may have a child some day, if God wills, she whimpered. Give me something, however mean, and you shall have many sons, promised the old woman, who had nose and chin meeting on her face. Good, said the wife, I will give you all I can find then. And she went to look in the larder. Coming back a few moments later, she handed the old woman with the nutcracker face a brown loaf. Will this do? she asked. It is all I can spare, honestly. There is nothing else in the house today. Wonderful, said the old woman. You can give me another when you get sons. Oh, may it be so in the name of the Almighty, said the carpenter's wife piously. Even one will do. You shall have many, my dear. Now I will go home and give my poor old husband something to eat with this brown loaf said the crone, and went away, putting the loaf in her bag. The carpenter's wife went about all day very happily at her daily work, singing, and wondered when she would have her first child. The old woman went home, fed her old husband, and took a small bag containing a hundred chickpeas back to the carpenter's wife. For the arms you have given me, she said, you shall have many sons, as I promised. Put these hundred peas in a kneading trough, and tomorrow they will become as many sons as there are peas. 
The carpenter's wife laughed and thought that the old woman must be mad. How in the world can peas turn into children? she screeched. You said I would have children. Can I not have them in the usual way? No, this is the quickest way for you to have them, said the old woman with nose and chin touching, and went away. The wife of the carpenter said to herself, Well, maybe the old creature is a witch, and there may be something in it. I will do as she says. Funnier things have happened. If by any chance this is the way to have children quickly, and I miss the opportunity, my husband will give me a terrible scolding. So she took the peas, put them in a kneading trough, and waited for the sons the woman had promised her. That night the husband came home having drunk more wine than usual, and abused his wife, saying, Move over, you barren cow, and let me get some peace and quiet in my own home. She had never said a word, but under her breath she muttered, Just you wait until tomorrow. You will see something extraordinary indeed. Just you wait. What are you mumbling about, silly creature? grumbled the husband. Mumbling those prayers all night, you get on my nerves. One of these days I'll leave you, just you see if I don't. Then he fell into a drunken slumber. The next morning the hundred peas had turned into one hundred lusty young sons. Papa, Papa, give me a drink of water, cried one. Mama, Mama, give me some bread, screamed another. Another cried, Pick me up. Yet another, I want to go for a walk. Papa, Papa, make me a paper windmill, demanded a fifth, and so it went on for about an hour. The bad-tempered carpenter had had enough of this at such an early hour in the morning, so he took up a stick and began to beat the chickpea children. Soon he had killed them all except one, who ran into the bedroom and hid away. After the carpenter had gone to the shop, the unfortunate wife said to herself crossly, Oh, devil take the man! He complained about my not having children, and now I've had them, he has killed them all. Is there no justice in the world? Oh, I wish I were dead. Then the pea which had escaped called, Mama, don't say that, I am here. I will look after you. The carpenter's wife could scarcely believe her eyes and ears, and she cried, How did you manage to escape, my son? What a miracle this is indeed. Has Papa gone? asked the child. Yes, said she. Then, how are you named? And he said, My name is Cecino, Mama. What a nice name, she said. Now you must go to the shop and take your father's dinner to him, to save me going today, for I feel very tired. I had a sleepless night. Yes, you must put the basket on my head, said the boy and I will carry it to Papa. The carpenter's wife, when the meal was ready, put the basket on the child's head and sent him off with the dinner. When he was near the shop, he began to cry, Oh, Papa, come and see, I am bringing your dinner. Then the carpenter said to himself, Oh, drat it, did I not kill them all? Aloud, he said, How did you escape when I killed all your brothers? Oh, I hid under the handle of the pitcher, said the pea-child, and I survived. Oh, what a clever boy you are, said the carpenter. You must go around among the country people and ask at all the houses whether they have anything to mend. Very well, said the boy, and the carpenter put him in his pocket. While he walked along the country road, the boy did nothing but chatter and every person he met said that the carpenter must be mad, because they did not know it was the boy in his pocket who was talking. When he saw some countrymen, he asked, Have you anything which I can mend for you? I am a good carpenter, I can assure you. They answered, Yes, we have something to be mended, but we cannot let you do it, for you are known to be mad. Mad? said he. Mad? 
I have never been taken for mad before, nor have any of my relatives ever been mad. I am wiser than you, I tell you. Why do you say I am mad? Because you do nothing but talk to yourself on the road, said they. Everybody has noticed it lately. How do we know you can mend things properly if you are mad? I was talking to my son, said the carpenter furiously. It is you who are unjust. Where is your son? they asked. In my pocket, of course, he shouted in reply. <laughs> That's a funny place to keep your son, they said sneeringly. Very well, I will show him to you, said the carpenter, and he took Cecchino with his two fingers and placed him upon the palm of his hand to show him off to them. Oh, what an amazing thing, they cried. You must sell him to us. Sell my son? What are you talking about? said the carpenter. I sell you my son, who is so valuable to me. He put the boy on the horns of an ox and said, Wait for me there, my boy. I will go to that house and ask if they have any work for me. So the boy said, I will wait here for you, papa. Now two thieves passed by, and seeing the ox and its brother standing alone, said, let us steal these oxen there with no one to look after them. Come. Then Cecchino called out as loudly as he could, Look out, Papa, two thieves are going to steal the oxen. Where does that voice come from? The thieves asked each other, and they went near to the oxen and saw the miniature boy on the horn of one of them as the carpenter hurried back to the cart. Oh, what have we here? said one of the thieves to the carpenter. You must let us buy him, whoever he is. We have found a rare creature for certain, and one that could be very useful to us. No, no, said the carpenter. What would his mother say if I sold him? I cannot do it. We will give you as much money as you wish, said the thieves. Just tell his mother that he died on the way home of some accident. It will be quite easy. Just try it. They tempted him so much that at last he gave the boy to them for a sack of gold. They took Cecchino, put him in a pocket, and went away. Then they went to the king's stable and wondered if they could steal a fine horse or two from there. Do not betray us now, they warned Cecchino, or it will be the worse for you. Don't worry, said Cecchino. I will not betray you. The thieves came back with three fine Arab steeds, which they had easily stolen, while there were no royal grooms about. They took them home and put them in their own stable. Afterwards, they went to Cecchino and said, Go, feed the horses, give them some oats, we are feeling too tired. So Cecchino was soon feeding the horses, but he fell into a brandish and a black horse swallowed him. When he did not return, the thieves went to look for him, but there was no sign of the tiny boy. He must have fallen asleep somewhere in the hay, they said, and went to look for him everywhere. Cecchino! Cecchino! they called. Where are you? Inside the black horse, cried Cecchino. So they killed the black horse, but Cecchino was not there. Cecchino, no tricks now, where are you? they called. Inside the bay horse, came the cry. So they killed the bay horse, but he was not in its stomach. Cecchino, Cecchino, the thieves called out once more. Where are you? But this time there was no reply. A great pity, they said. That child would have been very useful indeed to us, and think of what we paid for him. Then they dragged the two horses which they had cut open into a field. A ravenously hungry wolf came loping past and saw the two dead horses. I will have a good meal, said he his tongue lolling out hungrily, and he ate and ate, managing to swallow Cecchino at the same time. The little boy had been in one of the horses all the time, 
but the thieves had missed seeing him because he was so small. Then the wolf became hungry again, and said to itself, I shall go and eat a goat this time. All that horse meat has given me too much wind. When Cicino heard the wolf talking about eating a goat, circling the field where the goat herd was sitting, he called out at the top of his voice, Goat herd! Goat herd! The wolf is coming to eat your goats! Beware! The goat herd began to throw stones at the wolf, and it ran and ran until it became sick, and Cicino was free once more. He hid under a large rock beside which some robbers were counting a sum of money. One of them said, Now we will divide this bag of money here, as we are far from anywhere and no one will see us. You others be quiet whilst I am counting, or I shall kill you. They kept very still and silent, for they did not want to die, and the robber who was counting had a very sharp knife and a bad reputation for killing without asking questions first. He began to count. One, two, three, four, and five, he said. Cicino then started to repeat the robber's words. One, two, three, four, and five. I told you not to speak while I am counting, shouted the angry robber. Keep still, or I will kill you. Once more he began counting. One, two, three, four, and five. And Cecchino imitated him again as loud as he was able. All right then, you have asked for it, roared the robber, and plunged his knife into the heart of the one he thought was imitating him. Now we shall see if any of you speaks, he said, and wiped his blade on his handkerchief. The counting continued, the robber beginning again, one, two, three, four, and five. As he got to the last number, Cicino once more chimed in with one, two, three, four, and five, as loud as he was able. Take care, bellowed the killer. If you say anything again, I shall have to finish you off. Do you think I want to be killed? cried the other robber. Carry on counting, I swear I will not speak. But the moment the counting began again, Cicino squeaked out the number of gold coins being counted, and the robber with the knife accounted for the second of his companions. When he was wiping his knife on his kerchief, Cicino began to count. There is someone else here after all, said the robber to himself, and I will be apprehended. So he dropped the bag of gold and ran for his life. When Cicino saw that he was alone, he came out and saw the two dead robbers and the bag of gold lying there unattended. He managed to get the bag onto his head and walked home with it. When he got near to his parents' house, he called out, Mama, Papa, look what I have brought you. Come out and meet me. When the carpenter's wife heard him calling, she went out to meet him and took the money, saying, Take care now, that you do not drown in these puddles of rainwater, and I will put this gold carefully away for you, my son. The woman went home to tell her husband how clever Cicino had been. She looked around for a moment to see if he was following, but could not see him. She got her husband, and they went searching for him everywhere. At last they found poor Cicino drowned in a puddle of rainwater, as his mother feared would be his fate. Her Lover's Heart If the published record is to be credited, young Mrs. Butler of London was unwittingly fed her lover's heart by her cruel husband on or about the 6th of June, 1707. The public print of the time adds a wealth of circumstantial detail which may be intended to add plausibility to the account. The lady was, for example, an heiress from Hackney Boarding School. Her admirer was a rich Mr. Perpont of Fenchurch Street, who had fallen at the Battle of Almanza in Spain. 
Readers of Boccaccio in Britain might well have been surprised that history was repeating itself so near to home, for the Italian writer had reproduced almost exactly the same series of events from a French troubadour's account dating to 600 years before the alleged scandal at Hackney. On that occasion, the Lord de Soucy's heart had been, equally inadvertently, consumed by the Lady du Fayel after he had gone off to die in Palestine. He fell at the siege of Acre in 1191. Thus runs the ninth story of the fourth day of the Decameron. But even the gruesome feasts of France and England are startlingly foreshadowed, again in striking detail, by the experience of the hapless Princess Kokla in 78 AD. She ate the heart of Prince Hodi of the Afghan frontier, according to every bard of the Punjab, as General James Abbott discovered when he actually located her memorial statue in 1848. The chief material difference from the other narratives seems to be that the Indian lady ate both a heart and liver roasted for her by her husband, Raja Rasalu, a traditional hero in North India. World tales have a habit of appearing again and again in the work of the great writers, almost as if there is something irresistibly archetypal about them. From the bards of the ancient Punjab to the troubadours and crusaders to Boccaccio and popular 18th century English reading, the lover's heart theme surfaced again in the words of Somerset Maugham. On his 90th birthday, the great writer related a version of the story to his nephew Robin, calling it a pretty little tale. This was on January 26, 1964, exactly 1,886 years after our first tracing of the recital in the Indian history, or legend, of Prince Hodi and Princess Kukla. Many, many years ago, there was a great prince and hunter, whose name is still remembered as a man of skill and cunning, and whose adventures are sung throughout the land of India. He was Raja Rasalu, and he was married to the beautiful princess, Rani Kokla. They lived in a splendid palace surrounded by beautiful gardens, a true abode for a king. Rasalu used to go out hunting, and after pursuing the fleet-footed deer on his wonderful steed Fuladi, which means steely, he would shoot one animal and bring back venison for his lady and feed it to her. One day she said, If I go with you on the hunt, the deer will come to me, for I have eaten so much of their meat that they will feel an affinity with me. The Raja agreed to take her along, and, sure enough, when the Rani seated herself in the forest, the deer crowded around as if fascinated. One of them, their leader, who was a great blue buck named Ludan, was so overcome that, in spite of his mate's warning, he ran to Kokla and threw himself at her feet. Now the Raja cut off his ears and his tail as trophies and let him go, but the buck swore vengeance, and he thought of a plan to punish Kokla the deer-eater. He made his way to the palace of another prince, the Raja Hodi, and began to wander and cavort in his gardens, eating the fruits and trampling the grass. Raja Hodi came out to kill Ludan, and the buck ran away, luring him by degrees to the palace of Rani Kokla. As he approached, he saw the wonderful gardens and the splendid castle, and then he saw the princess herself on the flat rooftop, walking arrayed in her finery. He called up to her, and she was attracted to him. After an exchange of conversation and poems, she invited him into her apartments. The minor bird which had been left on guard tried to stop him, and told another guard bird, a parrot, that they should inform their master, Prince Rasalu, that a strange man had been allowed into the castle. The birds protested to the Rani, but she scolded them, saying that nothing wrong was being done, 
Entertaining a traveller was, after all, quite a normal thing to do. Then, in her rage, Kokla took the miner and wrung her neck. The parrot, however, was more crafty. Instead of reproaching the princess, he said, Princess, you were right to punish this bird for her insolence. Let me out of my cage, and I shall peck her, just to show my own displeasure. The Rani opened the door of the cage. The parrot pecked the miner, and then flew away. Seeing this, Prince Hodi became afraid. Embracing Kokla hastily, he fled to his own palace and threw himself on his bed, weeping bitterly for the loss of Kokla. Upon looking everywhere in the forest, the parrot came upon his master Rasalu and told him what had happened. Rasalu mounted Fuladi and rode him at top speed to his palace, while a plan formed in his mind. The Rani was lying asleep when Rasalu arrived home. He at once told Shadi, his parrot, Fly to the princess's couch. Take the ring from her finger without waking her. Then speed to Prince Hodi's palace with it and inform him that I, Rasalu, have been killed by a fall in the woods and that the princess awaits him. Say that the ring is proof that the message is indeed from her. Shadi flew with all haste to Hodi's palace and told him what he had been instructed to say. Hodi sprang upon his horse and was soon at Rasalu's gate. Rasalu himself came out and asked him what he wanted. I, I, I was pa passing by, stuttered Hodi, and, and seeing this magnificent place thought I would look at it. Pray come in, said Rasalu, for a guest must be treated as such. Hodi could not refuse, for fear of arousing suspicion. As he dismounted, Rasalu called out, Now die, faithless and dishonorable one! He drew his sword and sliced right through Hodi, from head to toe. So sharp and thin was his wondrous sword that Hodi did not even feel the impact. In fact, he called out, You have not touched me, and I shall have my revenge! Just move but one inch, cried Rasalu, and you will see. Sure enough, as soon as Hodi moved, he split in two along the line of the sword cut. Now Rasalu took out Hodi's liver and heart, saying, Kokla shall have venison today such as she has never had before. The princess was still asleep. Rasalu quickly cooked the heart and liver and carried it to her. As she ate it, she said, I have never tasted anything so delicious as this, my own dear love, which you have killed and cooked for me with your own sweet hands. So it should taste to you, answered Raja Rasalu, for it is the flesh of your lover. Eat as much as you will. Giving an agonized cry of the greatest anguish, the Rani ran to the turret of the castle and prepared to jump. As she looked down, she saw the body of Hodi lying there. Such was her grief that she was dead before she reached the ground, throwing herself from that towering height. Rasalu, for his part, was staggering with shock. He descended to the bottom of the precipice upon which the castle was built and kissed the lips of his beloved Kokla for the last time. Then, aware of the affinity which there was between the princess and Hodi, he placed a cloth over the two of them and buried them side by side in the nearby ravine. He was utterly lonely for the rest of his days. The New Hand This story is very widely dispersed from southern Europe to Scandinavia and is also found in Britain and the United States. The New Hand is often taken to be Jesus, who both works miracles and teaches people to avoid pride. It is found among the gypsies, who may have helped to carry it to Russia, Sicily and elsewhere from the Middle East. The tale is similar to many unofficial legends of Jesus current in Palestine. 
The following is adapted from the recital of Dick Brown, a Virginian at Sand Mountain, Alabama, taken down by the American J.P. Suvercrop in 1871. The Brothers Grimm have a famous 19th century version, The Old Man Made Young Again, but the tale is certainly centuries old. There was once a sawmill on the edge of a wood, not far from here in Alabama, with the running river turning the wheel. An old black man, and a very fine man he was, owned the mill. But his son, named Sam, was quite unlike his father. Lazy and useless he was. His father had to work hard to keep things going. One day a stranger came along to the mill, a poor-looking fellow, who said that he would like to learn sawmilling, and that if he could be taught he would work a year for nothing. The old man was glad to have his help, and young Sam thought that it was all right too, because then he could shift some of his own work onto the new hand. So the new hand started, toting boards and doing chores around the place. The owner liked the new hand very much, and always gave him whatever he had himself. But Sam used to push the new hand around behind his father's back. When the old man caught Sam bossing and abusing the new hand, and it happened several times, he punished him properly. The day came when an old man came to collect a load of planks, and he was groaning with a bad back, and wishing that he was young and spry as he used to be. Then up spoke the new hand, and he said to Sam and his father, If both of you go into the woods where you cannot see what is happening, leaving this man with me, and wait until I call you, I will make him as good as new again. But you must promise not to look, otherwise something bad will happen. So they promised, and the old man and his son went into the woods until they could not see what was happening at the mill. The new hand said to the man with the bad back, Go and lie down on the saw frame. When the man did so, the new hand took the saw and cut him in two. Then he took the halves of the man and threw them into the stream, and the two pieces joined together. The man came down from the stream alive and well, young and frisky. He started to thank the new hand, but he told him to say nothing at all. When the new hand called them back, Sam and his father came running, and they were astonished when they saw this young-looking black in place of the old limping man. They asked all kinds of questions, but the new hand would not say anything about it, so they gave up and things went on the same as usual for a time. Then the old man got word that his mother was very ill, and that he had better go away to visit her. Before he left, he told Sam not to make any trouble for the new hand, and if he did, he would get a beating when his father returned. But Sam forgot this just as soon as the old man had gone, and behaved in a very overbearing way towards the help. Finally, the new hand said to Sam, If you don't stop behaving like this, I'll quit as soon as my time's up, and that's tomorrow. But Sam was really insolent, and he said, Go now, you fool. Well, the next day, sure enough, the new hand was gone, though nobody saw him go, and nobody passed him on the road or in the woods. And the very next day along came the black man who had been made young again, and he brought with him his wife, an old woman, carrying a lovely fat possum and a basket of potatoes, which fairly made Sam's mouth water. After passing the time of day, the visitor asked after the new hand, saying that he wanted him to make the old woman well, as he had done for him. Sam said, Oh, he'll be here tomorrow. Just leave the possum and come again. I'll give it to him when he gets back. But the man was too smart for that, and would not leave the things. Sam was afraid that he would lose the possum, so he said, The new hand has gone off to see his sick father, and he told me before he went to carry on and do the same that he did for you. So the man told Sam what was wanted, 
and Sam told the man to go into the woods and shut his eyes. Then Sam sawed the woman in two and threw the pieces into the stream, but there they stayed. Sam, of course, got very scared and went down to the water and tried to join the two pieces, but they stayed as they were. Then the old woman's husband came running and shouting out of the woods, sure that something was wrong. The neighbours collected, and they took Sam away, and he was found guilty of murder. The judge put on the black cap and said, Hang Sam by the neck until he is dead, and the Lord have mercy on poor Sam. Now Sam's old father came running, and he rolled in the dust and begged for Sam's life, but the judge would not let him free. Then everyone went towards the gallows, very solemnly. The judge asked Sam if he had anything to say, and Sam suddenly saw the new hand, standing in the crowd and laughing, and Sam thought how badly he had treated that poor man. So Sam said, Brothers and sisters, Listen to what I am going to say. Never act haughtily to anyone, because if I hadn't acted in that way to a man who is here in this crowd today, I'd have been heaving saw logs instead of going to be hanged this day. Then all his friends started to cry and roll about, but the new hand jumped up alongside Sam and said to him, Are you sorry for your actions? Sam said, Indeed I am and I ask pardon and hope you'll forgive me when I'm gone. The new hand spoke out in a loud voice to the crowd, saying, How can you hang this man when the old woman he is supposed to have killed is standing right over there? Sure enough, there she was, standing beside her husband. So they let Sam down, and there were great celebrations but they have never seen the new hand from that day to this anywhere at all.